Hello, TEDx Tech. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, or good afternoon. Oh, good morning. Um, I was just telling the organizers, I was asking them why I was the first speaker. I thought I would be like the last speaker because I would like to. <laughs> I was going to, sh and then they asked me, okay, who would you like to swap with? And I'm like, uh, you can do it go deadly now. But somehow I ended up here. So um, I want to say, it's a privilege to be here, and um, I hope that at the end of today, we would not just exchange ideas, but would also leave here inspired. Okay, so straight to my TED talk. I have just 18 minutes. I'm going to be talking today on the judicious use of social media for healthcare. But firstly, I'm going to ask a question, and I just want to, I want you to signify by a show of hands if this applies to you in any point. Has there been any point that any of you left a doctor's office or any healthcare practitioner at all, and then you felt you were more confused than when you entered the clinic? Please, can I see your hands? Just show of hands. Thank you. I can see some of you. Now, the truth is, a lot of you are not alone. I once put out a post on social media asking people, what's the greatest challenge you have when you when you're talking about doctors or communication generally. And then there was just this general complaint. Doctors don't tell us anything. You just come into the clinic, they look at your file, look at your folder, look at your face, ask you a lot of questions. And at the end of the day, you just go, they, they give you drugs, tell you to go for this and this. And there's just a whole lot that goes on around communication in healthcare that I feel personally could be tailored and structured better. But I think the problem is not just with the healthcare system, but it's with communication generally. I think as individuals, a lot of us, especially Nigerians, we kind of feel that there is some information that is meant for some people and some information that is meant for a particular set of people. And so we, we tend to hoard information. Now, in healthcare generally, we've seen this scenario I just outlined. And someone might ask, what's the challenge? Because most times I get to talk with my colleagues and I ask them, so why don't you talk to your patients? Why don't you communicate with them? Why don't you tell them you know, what their diagnosis is? Why don't you discuss with them? And then there are a lot of reasons that they've given. I think the very first one, I don't know, I can't see the slides, so I wouldn't know what you're seeing on the screen. But I think one of the likely problems especially with the Nigerian population, is one, the fact that WHO released statistics and said that in 2019, the ratio of doctors to patients in Nigeria is about four doctors to 10,000 patients or 10,000 people. And that's really, it might just look like numbers to you, you know, but in the grand scheme of things, especially since WHO says that the ideal should be one doctor to about 600 patients or 600 individuals. And then Nigeria is one of the most populous countries in the world. So one of the reasons some of the medics always bring up is, firstly, we're not enough doctors, we're not enough healthcare practitioners. And then you have the excuse of, we are, let me not call it excuse, we also have the reason of, we are understaffed. That's another likely reason. And of course we have, a lot of issues with poor remuneration, especially here in Nigeria. We're not just paid poorly, but then the little that you expect to have, you don't see it. And that's why you see a lot of doctors and healthcare workers going on strikes every day in Nigeria. And so this could be likely reasons why the doctor might feel that they don't have enough time to communicate with their patients. But the truth is, it is not an excuse. It's not an excuse because medicine, just like every other career, is a transaction. It's a transactional business. And so when you pay me my money, or pay me your hard-earned money as a doctor, you're expecting value for that money. You're expecting service for the money you have just offered me. And so when you leave my clinic or leave my office, it's actually an error for you not to know why you came, what is wrong with you, your mode of treatment or your treatment plan and what the future is for you. And this is something that I have tried effortlessly or effortfully, there's a word like that, you know, to 
advise and tell healthcare workers, you have no excuse. You could have thousands of reasons why you don't want to communicate or you might not communicate with your patient, but none is an excuse. Because at the end of the day, when there's a breach in communication or when there is flawed communication, there is, the problem is greater than what we see. I'll give you an instance. Let's talk about dangers of flawed communication. Now, okay, let's talk about communication firstly. The thing about communication is a lot more people are yet to see that it's beyond just talking to people, but it's about actually about being understood by the next person. Now, when you're talking about health communication, it's a triangle. You have, of course, the message, you have your messenger, and then you have the audience. And I like the theme of today's event, talking about diversity. Diversity is something that is very, it's, it's a theme that I think that resonates with the era that we, we currently live in, you know, right now, because there's a lot when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Now, when the messages are flawed, or just to give you dangers of flawed communication, firstly, it's very obvious. I'll take us back to 2014, when there was the Ebola breakout. And I'll ask another question. How many of us here got the WhatsApp broadcast that for you to cure Ebola, you should bait with salt? How many of us baited with salt? It's okay to hide your hands. If you did not bait with salt, your mother or your father baited with salt. And some of them went the extra mile and drank salt. And here is what happened. It might sound funny. Actually, it's funny. But here is what happened to those of us who were in healthcare practice. During that period, we noticed an increase in the number of patients who were having heart diseases and patients who were coming down with complications of hypertension. Why? Salt, water retention. And these are things that actually, you know, complicate matters for people who are already having long-standing heart diseases. And you know that in Nigeria and Africa generally, most people don't even care. They don't, we don't have the culture of normal screening. and routine. So some people just feel like, I don't have hypertension, it's not my portion. You know, and it's not our portion, actually. Um, I mean, whose portion is it? But at the end of the day, we were having cases of, you know, aggravated and elevated blood pressure just because of one misinformation. I talked to some of my colleagues, and then when I started my social media um, branding and career, a lot of them were like, ah, Chuma, you have time. You are, you are out there on social media talking to me. Oh, well, you, you have time. You know, that was just one thing I kept hearing. And then there were those of, of them who felt like, ah, you're giving out too much information. Why are you telling people? How, will, how are we going to have patients still come into the clinics if you are telling them all this free information? And my answer was simple. Every information I'm giving out on social media is available on Google. But here is the difference between what I am giving them and what they are accessing on Google. I am a messenger that can be trusted, I'm a messenger that is credible, and I'm a messenger that can fact check whatever information I'm giving them. And that's how you can control and, you know, control public health and promotion in Nigeria and Africa and the world generally. So we can as well decide as healthcare workers or whatever business you might find yourself in. It could be economics, it could be banking, it could be law, it could be anything. And you feel like this information is for me. But at the end of the day, you can ask yourself one question. The more I heard this information, what exactly is it adding to my bank account? I'll answer for the doctor. Zero to our bank account. Now what is adding to us is more pressure because I'm having more patients who are coming in with a lot more complications because they don't know how, they don't know, they don't have an understanding of preventive healthcare practices. I have more patients who are not educated, so they don't know how to take their medication. They don't know how not to mix their medication with certain herbal concussions. And then they come back with complications. And so if I had, I was one doctor to 20 patients, and then I have three more who come down with complications, I will have one, I'll become one to 23. And I'm still going to be paid the poor remuneration, and I'll be owed for more than six months. And I can't do anything about it except strike a little. And when I'm tired, I will go back to work because that's Nigeria. So at the end of the day, we all have a role to play when it comes to communication. Another danger of flawed communication is that it prevents adaptation of healthy practices. Now, when you're talking about flawed communication, I'm not just talking about zero communication. I'm also talking about 
one-sided communication, blanket communication, um, outright unverified information that you spread. I'll give you an example of a blanket communication. One blanket communication is something I saw on social media recently. I also reposted it, but I gave a balanced view. And it's very simple. Every woman who is trying to conceive should try to take folic acid. Once you're ready to conceive, try to take folic acid. That's a practice, you know, before you even get pregnant. And while you're pregnant, of course, please continue taking your folic acid. However, I can just say that and stop. And that's communication. I've reached out to people. I've helped people, right? But there are some people that I may have put in danger by that blanket communication. And those are the people who are at risk for hormonal cancers. Persons who are at risk for hormonal cancers or have family histories of hormonal cancers should not take folic acid. Or even if you must, you have to do that with the guidance of your doctor. So when we're talking about communication in public health or even in social media, there are a lot of you here who might want to start leveraging. Oh, we're seeing a lot of people who are doing a lot on social media, healthcare promotion and all healthcare influencers. That's great. But you have to understand that whatever you're putting out there has to be verified. It has to be wholesome. It has to be tailored to your community. If your communication is flawed or if your communication is not clear, it's as, it's as bad as no communication. And it can do as much damage as when you kept quiet. So now talking about communication again, I'm just rounding up. Talking about diversity in communication, one thing about the messenger or whoever it is that wants to put out information that you should know, especially on social media, because we're talking about judicial issues, is the fact that as a messenger, you should be non-judgmental. I talked about credibility. You should be non-judgmental and you should be careful with your words so you don't come, out, come off as condescending. One of the very normal condescending things we say, or let me not say condescending, one of the things that could be judgmental and could cause a lot of danger, case in point, Oh, that woman had caesarean section. The other one had normal delivery. Now, that sounds eh, normal. Everybody says it. Oh, how, how did you give birth? Normal delivery. How did you give birth? Caesarean section. Suddenly, you have women who get pregnant the next time, and they come to the hospital and say, I want to have a normal delivery. I didn't have a normal delivery the last time. And then no matter what you tell them and tell them, oh, you have an indication for CS, you have to go in for CS, you see some of them who leave the hospital go to certain, I, don't, I, don't, I can't call them maternities, but then they go to some certain birth attendants, you know, who put them at risk, tell them you can push. Some of them go to miracle centers, spiritual centers. They tell them you can push. Don't, don't mind the report of the doctor. Push. And as they are pushing, they push out uterine rupture, push out different types of complications, and some of them lose not just their lives, but the lives of the precious child they were seeking. Our information and the way we put out information is very important. So instead of saying stuff like cesarean section and normal delivery, how about we start saying it the way it is medically? Cesarean section and vaginal delivery, those are two normal deliveries. The way we casually, or the way we casually put out our information is very important. Then also talking about our audience, we should endeavor to understand our audience. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to spare my colleagues here. Now, when we're, you know one thing about medicine is that we're taught with a lot of Latin words and really ambiguous words. And sometimes you can be fooled into thinking that the more you speak that, or the more you say that, the more reasonable you sound. And so instead of telling you, you have maybe colloquially what we call Apollo. We know that, Abby. When you say that somebody has Apollo in the eye. Instead of saying, maybe in an area where people can understand, I say, sir, you have viral conjunctivitis. And then the old man who has stayed in the village for how long is looking at me and is hearing conjunctivitis and thinking the world is over. And especially in this world where coronavirus, you have heard viral con is over. You know, so we should learn to actually tailor our communication to whatever audience we are talking to is very important. Now to the role of social media. Social media has come to stay. Social media has come to stay. And 
Aside the traditional means of communication, talking to your patients in the clinic, one of the other ways that you can leverage communication is social, through social media. Almost everybody is on social media. Now, um, I don't know if you're seeing this slide about the most used social media platforms in Nigeria. This is as at the third quarter of 2020. Number one is WhatsApp, a.k.a. WhatsApp. You see, WhatsApp is responsible for a lot of damage. And it's not because of the tool itself, but because of the people who use it. And so because it's very easy to forward, a lot of us just get the information. You don't even read it. You just forward it. And then some of us go the extra mile. Some of our parents, God bless them, go the extra mile to call you and make sure you saw what they sent you and tell you that you should <laughs> take it easy. You're eating tomato and lettuce can cause cancer. You know, and they are telling you, don't eat banana and granite and drink cold water. <laughs> you're going to have stomach ulcer. And then you're wondering, where is this coming from? It might sound funny to you, but there are some people who are actually, they are actually holding on to any information they see because they see social media as a god. So, as individuals, we all have a role to play with social media. According to statistics, it shows that about, we are 200, about 200 million Nigerians, you know, according to what we see out there. Then, the number of internet users, as at last year, was 99.5 million. You know, and the number of social media, media users was at 28 million. And we can see the percentages of each of the platforms with WhatsApp and Facebook leading. And those are the major areas where our, our village people are, our communities are, our families are. We all have a role to play. We all have a role to play in the judicial use of social media. It's actually quite embarrassing that even some young people are at fault when it comes to this. Social media has been so helpful and that's why it breaks my heart, you know, or it broke my heart when, you know, the government of Nigeria banned Twitter. It didn't make any sense to me because I've had so many testimonies personally and I know that that even cuts across different people. I once got a voice note from someone I didn't know. I would call her Ego. She told me, she, it was a voice note she sent and she just wanted to say thank you. She said last night, according to her, she said that the night before, her neighbor's child was convulsing. And when the neighbor's child was convulsing and the mother started shouting for help, she rushed to the house. And just in time, she, she was just in time to see the mother using crude oil, trying to force crude oil into the boy's mouth. And you know, just different things, different concussions. Yeah, there are many. Crude oil, onions, breast milk. Um, they use the spoon, push back the tongue, do, do different things. There are even some people who go as far as roast the baby's legs to remove the evil spirit. Now, I had talked about this on social media, and she said when she saw that happening, she just screamed stop, and all she could remember was the extensive thread I made on first aid for convulsions or children who are having seizures. And she went back to that, she just told the woman stop, undress, and she, she said she didn't even know how she was able to remember what it was I put out there on Twitter. And that was how that child's life was saved. Social media has its ups, yes, and it has its downs. But we should leverage on the ups, and how we can help, firstly, is to optimize social media for good. Secondly, before you get or share any information, before you share any information, simple steps. If you don't go home with anything, please remember this. Stop. Firstly, stop. Reflect on what you've read. Then please take an extra second or seconds to verify what you've read before you can decide whether to, to forward or to stop the progress of that misinformation. Fake news, according to um, CNN, a study we had with CNN, um, IC, ICJF, said that fake news spreads 70 times faster than the real news. 70. That's really fast because we know that fake news can be sweet. So please, stop, reflect, verify. And in everything you do, every time you get the opportunity, please try not just to talk, to educate, and to please communicate clearly. I would end by saying, effective communication is a public health tool, but lack of it is a public health risk. Good communication is good work. And in the good words of Martin Luther King, God does not need our good works. Our neighbors do.
whatever you do, please remember that your communication could either make or mar the health progress of your neighbor. Thank you.